Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining. And just for some housekeeping rules, this webinar is being hosted by the International Trade Council. And today's webinar is entitled Innovation in Uncertainty and Scarcity, What We Can Learn from Emerging Market Innovation. Our speakers for today are Mr. Alan Cocknell and Mr. Martin Miller. Mr. Allen is the head of Ignite Exponential Flextech Strategic Innovation and Design Business Unit. Initially trained as an engineer and with a passion for design, Mr. Allen has two decades of experience working in stakeholder insight, new business models, and disruptive technology in both developed and emerging markets to navigate uncertainty and create sustainable growth. Together with him is Mr. Martin, an award-winning, commercially-minded, ambitious, and highly motivated industrial design and innovation leader with over 20 years of working experience. He has successfully developed a wide range of commercially successful and innovative products for many different sectors. So at the end of our webinar, we will be able to ask questions to our speaker, and we will also send you a recording of this webinar within 48 hours. So without further ado, I can now hand over the microphone to Mr. Allen. Um, Mr. Allen, are you there? Thanks so much, Onyx, and um, thank you to the International Trade Commission, uh, Trade Council for the opportunity to talk with you all today. Uh, Martin and I would like to share with you some of our experience helping companies to innovate and grow in disrupted times. And we hope that this experience can help you to survive and to thrive too. But before I get onto that, I'd like to start with a question. Which is riskier, developing a new product or technology for your own market or, um, or, or developing or, or introducing an existing product into a new market? So Onyx, I think we have a poll we can get people's thoughts on for that. So this is the classic uh, Ansoft matrix. Is it riskier to develop a new technology or is it riskier to develop a new, into a new market with that technology? So as people think about their answers, and hopefully you can add to the poll that should be showing on your screen, um, we know that existing existing global market penetration is, is the least risky. It's about 33% when you look at the data that we have, whereas innovating in a new product and a new market is about 85% risky. Okay, so maybe the polling system's broken. I'm not seeing anything um, come up. So wh why, don't we, why don't we go on with this? Um, so what, what we found in our research and, and from our experience, and don't have to take my word for it, uh, this is an HBR 2007 study and, and there's others that stand behind this, is that innovating in a new product and a new technology, and I say this as an engineer and a designer with lots of technical experience, is actually less risky than innovating in a new market with an existing product or service. And that, you know, that goes against my initial Conception, there's so much that goes into overcoming technical challenges to develop new technologies into market. How can it be that a new market innovation is riskier than a new product one? Well, I think the best way to really capture this is articulated by this gentleman. Um, Steve Wozniak obviously knows a thing or two about technology development, but also about successfully growing companies. So here he is, the co-founder of Apple Computers, talking a couple of years ago at the front end of Innovation Festival. And what he said was, marketing is more important than R&D. And he summarized this really nicely. If you don't know what consumers want, and it could be customers in a B2B market, it doesn't matter how well it performs. And it's an evidently true statement, but it's something that resonates with me as I think about that relative risk of innovation. Technical innovation is risky and it is challenging and it may well bring, bring larger returns, but there are plenty of, of things that can go wrong in introducing uh, existing products and services even that have been de-risked into new markets. So why does that matter now? Why am I talking about that? Well, when you innovate in, uh, in new markets, sorry, can I check that you can all see the screen or are you still looking at the poll? I can see the screen, Alan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, so what we, what we found is as the world changed around us with COVID-19 disruption earlier this year, nine or 10 months ago for, for some of us, depending on the markets that you're based in, 
um, we found that those existing markets around us that we knew and understood suddenly became new markets overnight. The availability of finance that was, was, was once there is suddenly no more. The access customers had to our business and, and us to them was suddenly no more. Consumers couldn't go to shops or pubs, uh, where, wherever the environment might be. And so the environments we were used to innovating for have been turned on their head. They become new markets. But it's more challenging than that. Those environments that were once environments of abundance have become environments of scarcity. We've talked about finance already, the ability for customers to get to us, the channels we would usually use to connect with them and otherwise have again been turned on our head. And, and we realized that we'd seen this challenge somewhere before. Between Martin and I, we have plenty of experience working with Western companies as they look to innovate in emerging markets. And the characteristics of those emerging markets, particularly I'm thinking of the mass market, the bottom of the pyramid, rather than serving those urban elites. And while there's all sorts of innovation we could talk about that happens in those markets, we're particularly interested in thinking, how do you take a successful Western company and a Western brand from the US or from Europe and introduce those products to serve consumers in those emerging markets in rural India, rural China, or, or in Africa, for instance? And one of the things that we found is the characteristics of that innovation, of, of scarcity, of, of a new market mindset, are also transferable to disrupted markets to the markets we're facing today. And we'll give you a number of examples in this talk. So for making that connection between emerging market innovation and the tools that we've used successfully in those spaces and the disrupted markets we find around us, we wanted to share a bit about how we think you need to go about innovating in scarcity and uncertainty. We'll share one specific model that we can use for doing that, which we call the four A's innovation framework. And we'll share a series of examples around that framework that show how other companies and businesses, both in emerging markets and disrupted markets have been able to respond and to thrive in some cases grow despite the disruption around them. So I'd like to start with an example and I'll, I'll jump between examples in emerging markets and developed markets or in, uh, in, in, in this case, starting in, in rural Africa. This is an amazing idea and this is a really inspirational idea. So what could we do if we took the energy that children have as they run and they play in a playground and we could harness that energy using a novel type of pump mechanism called a play pump. And we pump that water up a tower, which provides that water for the local community and for the local schools. Great idea, right? We're using the energy that children have to solve a particular need in the market. Lots of pluses. And the wealthy US donors and NGOs thought so too when they saw the first three of these installations in South Africa performing really well, really exciting. And they invested millions and millions of dollars over a number of years to learn from those first installations and roll that out across Africa. Good news, right? Big success. Well, unfortunately not, because despite all that expertise and all of that investment, just a few years later, this was the situation in Malawi, for instance, where you know you could call this a sort of a play pump graveyard where they were either not installed or they, or they were removed because they weren't working. And what we see in this example, and, and we've, you know, we see in other examples as well, even in, in, in both the emerging markets, but also in our disrupted market, is people making a couple of common mistakes. And I'll just give you a few of those examples. So firstly, we see people relying on assumptions. In this case, the initial play pumps worked really well in the South African schools. But what happened is they moved those into other locations. The surface conditions might have been the same, the size of the school, the number of children, the size of the playground. But the conditions underneath the surface were very different. And because there were different borehole conditions, some of these pumps that worked well in the schools in South Africa just didn't work elsewhere in Kenya and here in Malawi, for instance, and across the rest of the continent. Obviously, it's a tremendously large place. And it, 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 in hindsight, we can see that there must have been very different conditions. But one of the assumptions that was made was that because this could work in one part of Africa, it could work elsewhere. But things that were below the ground really showed that assumption not to be true. Another example is, you know, we often see companies obsessing and focusing on product. Product is important. And in this case, it's the most tangible part of the innovation. You know, it's the, it's the new thing that you can see on top of the surface, as it were. Um, and the product's great and it, it does a really nice job. But what happens when it goes wrong? There's no parts available for local manufacture. It's actually quite a complex mechanism to be able to make this interplay happen between the children's play in one orientation and the pumping mechanism in another. And when it went wrong, the rest of the ecosystem around the product wasn't there. The spare parts weren't available. The local uh, maintenance and engineers didn't know how to fix it. It wasn't based on something they knew how to use. And so this 
focus on product, which we also see happening in a lot of other organizations, means that means that we weren't able to, they weren't able to build a full, a full ecosystem that really worked. And I guess that links to our third point. We often see organizations ignoring key stakeholders. It's very common and very good to focus on consumers and users and understand their needs. But we also need to understand the needs of the, the purchasers and the users and the state and the and the uh, the maintenance teams and the suppliers and distributors, et cetera. And we need to cast that network really broadly. And we see, especially when people are innovating in new markets, they can often forget to do that, assuming they know they know the the the, the needs of those different stakeholders. An example here is that water needs to be available and pumped all the time, not just in break time or during the school day. What about in the holidays? And so what happened in many of these schools is that because the demand on the pumps was, uh, was, was considerable, and if there weren't other pumps installed that could do this job instead, all of a sudden this became a necessity. And what happens when I tell you, you have to play for an hour on that pump today? It's not much fun anymore, is it? And that starts to become something a little bit bit less fun, a little less good, and a less, little bit less morally um, productive. So, so what seems like a very good idea on the surface of it, I believe was somewhat undermined as it was rolled out from this initial first installation in South Africa across the rest of the continent. Now, there are lots of positives about this, and there are lots of other um, innovations that are similar. But I think as you look at how we can learn from these sorts of mistakes in our own organization and make sure we build organizations that when we reply to um, a changing marketplace, we don't focus too much on assumptions. We are able to think beyond the product and think about the complete ecosystem. And we consider the needs of all of the stakeholders. It's not rocket science, but it's actually very difficult to do within many organizations. So let's talk a bit about the four A's. And I'll, I'll go through each of these in, in a little bit more detail over the next couple of slides. The four A's was a, a methodology, a, a framework popularized by C.K. Pralahad uh, just after the turn of the, of the millennium. And he wrote a book to show the power of this sort of framework called the, the Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. And it was popularizing the idea and, and, and celebrating the idea that you could innovate for these emerging market consumers earning less than $10 a day or possibly even less than $2 a day in many of the encounters I've been involved in. There might be 2 billion consumers in the world still today earning less than $2 a day. And yet there's a profitable opportunity for Western companies to serve them. But the mindsets and the approach that you need are different. The model is, is, is nice and we really like it because it approaches innovation with a scarcity mindset. And we've been able to use this model for a wide range of problems, many of which have nothing to do with emerging market innovation itself, but where the barrier to entry or the, or, or the barrier to getting more um, customers involved is a, key, key, is a key component. How is this model different to others you might know of? So hopefully many of you are familiar with the four Ps model, product, price, place and promotion, often known as the four P's of marketing. Let's talk through those and then I'll show you how the four A's is different. So starting off, we're starting, we're product centric. We're thinking just about the product, the features, the benefits, what that product needs to deliver to the prize and delight. We're then thinking how we create something for those features, what that'll cost us. And the price, typically cost plus margin, we're thinking about value for money. How do we deliver great value for money? Place, where do customers come across my product, um, how can they access my product or, or how do I get to them? And promotion, how do I shout using all the channels available to me about the, uh, about the, the, the features and the benefits of my products and, 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 and the great value that it will provide to you? Well, the four A's model, because it's coming from a point of view of, of scarcity rather than abundance, one of uncertainty rather than certainty, turns this on its head. We start off thinking about when. We think, how does a customer become aware of the need for, for this product, service, or category? How do they become aware of my brand or my product? And until we've understood how they become aware of us and the need for the product or service I want to provide, there's no point thinking about the other aspects of this. You need to tackle awareness first. Once, once consumers are aware or customers are aware of the need for my product or service, we think about how we get it to them. How do we get our product and service to them? and or vice versa. In emerging markets, what you see is that you know, distribution can be more challenging, it can be more uncertain. Consumers don't necessarily have the ability to travel as far or as easily in, in, in the Western markets that, uh, that, that our, our customers might be used to innovating in uh, and serving. And then we think about accessibility, affordability again, uh, but this isn't just price, it's not value for money. We have to start from what they can afford. And I'll come back to this a couple of times because it's a really important principle. In each of these cases, we're starting with what they can do now, we're not assuming that if we build it, 
that they will come to us because that's the four P's mindset. And in, in emerging markets and markets of scarcity, that's simply not always the case. And having helped consumers become aware of our product, understood how they, how, how our product or service is accessible to them, how they can afford it within their, their, their discretionary income today, their, the availability of their, their finance today, we then work out what we need to do to make it acceptable to them. And I want to emphasize here, acceptability isn't supposed to mean it's a substandard product. It's not as good as elsewhere. We're still looking to surprise and delight that customer or those consumers. But we're looking to do it once we've been able to ensure that we're targeting a market that is aware of us, can get to us, and can afford us. Because doing anything else means we're building a product that won't really serve those customers. We're diminishing our market. And our mindset for this is to think about this like a series of hurdles. We need to take customers 100% of the potential market in a given country or geography or even in our own market around us. And we need to make sure that they're first aware of us, that they can get to us, that they can afford us, and then finally, that they can deliver on them. And you'll see that this turns the model on its head. We're not focusing on having the best product anymore. We're focusing on having the best product that will do the job consumers need us to do, having, having considered the other barriers. So I hope this principle makes sense. It's as much a change in mindset as in, as in discipline, because we all know these things are important. That's intuitive. But the mindset is very important and something I think people find most difficult. So I've been talking for a little bit. I just want you to think about this for a moment. And we'll have our, our second poll here. And, and I'd love, love you to think about you know, which is the biggest barrier for customers in your industry today. Having thought about these four barriers, is it awareness? Is it the ability for your future customers to know about you? Is it accessibility or, or, or your category? Is it their ability to connect with you and your products? Is it their ability to afford you? Or is it that they don't like your product once they get to you? I'll give you a chance. We'll see if the poll works this time and we'll have a chance to give that a go. Okay, lots of votes for awareness so far. Affordability is important. Okay, so we've got a mix between awareness. Oh, awareness more important. Okay, so it seems like the main focus is between either customers' awareness of us um, or the affordability. Not so much in accessibility at the moment, and I think that that may be true. It depends on the markets you're coming from. And it, I, I like the fact that we're not all jumping to acceptability. We often see clients, as I say, obsessing over the product and not being able to think through those other um, those those other results. Super. Okay. Um, so if we move back to the presentation, um, let, let me break this down for you, and I'll give you a sort of worked case uh, example of how this works for for us uh, with, with a particular topic. We won't go through the, the canvas in each case, but it'll give you a sense of one of the ways that we use this, for instance, in, in physical face-to-face -face workshops, as we might all remember we used to do once upon a time. Um, this can work physically or it can work visu uh, visually. Obviously, on the top of this chart, you have the four A's that we've been mentioning. Down the left-hand side, we think about the barriers, and we're looking for evidence in the market that help us understand through research, through uh, collective experience and judgment, what are the barriers that customers or consumers or other stakeholders have to becoming aware, accessing our product, for it to be affordable and for it to be acceptable. What are the needs? Well, we translate those into solution agnostic needs and then find ideas that help us to deliver on those. We like this model, just to emphasize, it helps us think through the full product, sorry, through the full user journey and the full ecosystem and not just to think about the product. It's a framework that allows us to challenge assumptions and build evidence rather than jump to conclusions or, or to, um, and, and therefore allows us to get outside of uh, today's paradigm. It allows us to translate all the requirements that stakeholders have into specific needs. And it allows us to aim big, to look across disciplines, to look across industries. Uh, and the, the tool won't do this. You know, you have to do it, but the tool's a way of keeping you honest and, and a, a structure that you can use to look beyond the industry boundaries and the disciplinary boundaries and to find new solutions. And we Build it up through evidence from awareness, accessibility, affordability, and I, I really recommend that you work in that way so you don't jump to conclusions. Um, and that really allows you to get outside of the, the restrictions of your own industry. And then obviously when you develop a solution, you start with the nature of that solution, but you can develop that within the framework that you've learned about and that you've understood in terms of the barriers and the needs you need to deliver on. 
So easy to talk about um, in an academic sense. Let's have a let's have a specific example. So in much of the rest of this presentation, we'll give you different examples from the emerging markets and also from uh, from, from West, Western companies um, in terms of how they have served customers in this area. Um, awareness, obviously, is the first of the A's, and we think about how customers become aware of our offering. It might also be about how they even learn about the existence of the category and the need for the category. Once upon a time, if you look across, in this case, we could be looking at um, rural India, hand washing just wasn't a common habit. So how would we have thought about and how did companies think about being able to enter that market? And ironically, hand washing is important in all markets now, especially so, um, especially so with COVID around us and the need to stay uh, socially distant and, and hygienic from each other. So really important topic. How do we drive greater use of, of, of hand washing? And so, you know, what are those barriers? Well, in, in emerging markets, when Unilever, for instance, was introducing their product through Hindustan Unilever into, into rural India, you know, one of the big barriers was existing habits. The habits for washing and cleanliness did exist, but they were different. And they maybe didn't involve soap or bar soap in the way that, uh, that, that they were looking to drive change in the market. And there were benefits to those that were very clear to those in the Western world, perhaps. Um, but, but many customers across, uh, across India simply wouldn't have been aware of that need in the first place. There's a low penetration of TV and internet. So the channels that, even today, the channels that were traditionally used in, in Western markets um, just simply didn't work in the same way. And, and that's not just the technology thing, that's also about the fragmentation of channels, the fragmentation of languages in some of these spaces. And there's also a very low trust of brands. And you know, to move to China, you can see an example in China where uh, many of the domestic brands are viewed with skepticism because of past issues with product tainting and, and challenges and, and uh, counterfeiting and challenges of that sort. So what we look to do is turn these into needs. So when we think about existing habits, how do we build existing habits and, and how do we reframe that as a need that we can address? So it's about educating about the category or educating about habits. Equally, we might think about word of mouth from people I trust. You know, Don't let it be the big brand telling you what you should do or the government or an NGO telling you what you should do. Those, that sort of parental approach maybe doesn't work. How can I hear things from family, from friends that tell me about the category, tell me about the need, and tell me about the sorts of change and the sorts of benefits that it means to me? You know, maybe that's a, a hearing from peers is a much more valuable channel to change habits and, and to build education. So we can look at um, analogies. We can look at what happens in other markets. Uh, we might think about, uh, you know, enabling technologies might be appropriate, and we might think about new business models and new commercial models and experiences we can create. And we look outside the industry at other places where those happen. What sort of things happened with Hindustan Unilever? Well, you know, a couple of interesting things, and we'll touch on some more later. You know, one of the things they did is they invested a lot in schools and in education to be able to help drive um, education through, uh, through schools so that kids were starting to build that habit as part of the curriculum um, in rural schools in India. And that then became entrenched you know, as years passed, it, they would also bring it home, uh, home to their families. And, and that message of the importance of, of hand washing, for instance, was, has been spread a lot through education in schools. I know uh, uh, P&G did that with Crest in China, for instance, for many years, um, investing in schools to drive new habits. But another thing when we think about word of mouth from people I trust is this sense of community. How can you have a traveling theater or a fair or a festival where the theme of the education and the entertainment might be around the need of hand washing or toothbrushing or whichever particular topic you're looking at. So it's less a, a government mandated or a, um, or, or a corporate message, but it's one that is coming through, uh, through the population, through the arts and through the communities. And we'll look at some more examples like that in a moment. So just a simple example of how we use the tool. And obviously, you know, when you get into detail, it can be more complicated, but I hope the thinking approach is, is clear. So let me just jump into a very different example. So you know, we jump from hand washing in, in rural India, and here we can think about you know, the World Swimming Federation and one of the leading competitive brands in this space and the way they were looking to, um, to, to, to compete. Their customers, oh, sorry, th th this organization that I worked with a number of years ago was forced into a really disruptive situation. They were forced into a product recall by a change in the Swimming, swimming Federation's rules. Their market was disrupted. No longer could their customers wear their uniforms in the pool. They would need to have a completely new set of products. And there are, there are a number of usual competitive responses to dealing with that. And there are agencies that are designed to deal with going out and reaching and retrieving those products um, and, and providing alternatives. And they could have done that. But instead, they took a brave and unusual decision. They recognized that this was an opportunity. And they traveled in person to each customer with their marketing R&D teams, both to provide the new product to retrieve the old one and understand those customers better. 
And in hindsight, they describe this as the best marketing investment they ever made, perhaps the best investment they nearly never made, but they were forced into this and they learned some really fascinating things that no agency would have, would have helped them to understand in this respect. They found that key customers were not actually the adults that they thought buying their two or $300 suits. These were teenagers that might've had four or five different products in different colors. And that helped them to understand the way to market and promote to these customers. It changed their relationship dramatically and created a community between their R&D and their marketing teams and, and, and some of these consumer groups. And, and that's really changed their ability to market and given them a competitive advantage in the marketplace going forward. So although they were forced into this by a disruption in their market, um, it was a real enabler for them go, to go forward and, and allowed them to have an unusual physical connection. Equally, a different example, back to the COVID response. Uh, in the uh, early COVID-19 lockdown in the UK, NatWest Bank and, and many other banks noticed that many of their customers were simply not able to access their services through online. Um, while there's very broad use of uh, digital and mobile banking uh, in the UK, something like a quarter of a million of their customers didn't have internet connections or the capabilities to use uh, the smart products that they, they've been provided with the apps, et cetera. And that may have been due to shielding or social distancing or simply due to, the, to banks and the, 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 those um, branches being closed. So they called a quarter of a million people directly, one-to-one, -to, -one, to check their well-being and their access to cash. And what they were doing there was creating a relationship, in this case, not physical, as in the last example, but, a, but, but, but allowing them to build that relationship with consumers and provide their service in a different way. So for me, the lesson here is that it's not about being digital or being physical. It's about finding a hybrid between physical and digital channels that starts from where the customer is and the community that they are in and how you can be a part of that community. So the second day is for accessibility. This is making sure your products or services are available to the consumer. In the case of an emerging market, a really great example was Unilever's project Shakti. This project empowered 70,000 women and nearly 50,000 men to become micro-entrepreneurs across rural India. What, what Unilever identified was instead of selling their products in bottles or packs, which were largely unachievable for the average rural Indian wage, they produced their products in single-serve sachets that could be sold at achievable prices. This had two real key main benefits. Firstly, a revenue stream was generated for the rural Indians who were selling the sachets. And secondly, it gave Unilever access to nearly 4 million households they may not normally have reached before. So I think the moral of this story is really that the most effective and successful solutions tend to be the ones where both parties benefit equally. If we look at the accessibility, accessibility from the perspective of a disrupted market, there's a company that we know well, it's called AMC, and they're an exhibition stand company local to Ignite here in the UK. They handled this really well. At the start of lockdown, the business instantly went from booming to absolutely nothing, literally overnight. They couldn't realistically see any new business until at least next year, and it may even be even longer than that. They couldn't access their usual customers, so they needed to think quickly and creatively, out of the box, you could say. So they came up with a new business model. This was to create quick and easy office space for companies and households who needed quality indoor working space at short notice. They had the designers, carpenters, and installers, and they all had the skills necessary to do this. They just needed to, tr to transfer them into working inside rather than outside. This opened a completely different market, but one they already had skills to survive and thrive in. So they officially launched this to their customers earlier this year, and sales literally came flooding in. They're currently looking at working with garden centers and other channels that they'd never have dreamed of just a few months ago in their old business. So it's not rocket science. There was a market and a need for outdoor, indoor space, and AMC found that they were able to evolve, pivot quickly, and exploit this opportunity. Thanks, Martin. So the third A is for affordability. Affordability is about what your customers can afford. And remember, in the Western market, we might have approached this as cost plus margin equals price. And the focus is on value for money. But in the emerging markets, in our own disrupted markets, we'll find that consumers just don't have the money. It's not about uh, if you build it, they will come. Cash flow is limited. It's quite often uncertain. And there's anything, it is little, if, if anything, perhaps in the way of savings. So instead, we need to start from what they have available financially. 
and we need to open ourselves up to other business models and profit models and types of value. We might make exchanges, for instance. A couple of slides ago, we, we talked about single serve sachets and for a few rupees, um, you can buy a, a, a a, a single serve sachet of shampoo or of soap or, or washing detergent, which maybe is not as good value as buying a full bottle, but if you can't afford the bottle, then, then it's what you can do. And I think this is one way that the disposable income that is available can allow those customers to, to access the market. But it is, it, is, it is a different mindset than simply thinking about value for money. This isn't just for consumables like single serve sachets though. Uh, in the picture, we have a, a system from Selco, a photovoltaic panel, and uh, which is being combined with a microfinance model. Uh, rural Indian consumers would find that electricity for them was quite expensive, but it was also quite unreliable. And Selco found a way of spreading the cost of a, a $200 system, which would include uh, solar photovoltaic panels, uh, a battery, uh, and the, the appropriate control system, so that the costs were similar to their energy costs as they would have been anyway. So their disposable, their, their usual spending on electricity was about the same, but over five years, they would buy this panel, coming out the end of it with the, the, the capital, a free system that they could use. But during that five years, not only were their costs about the same, but they were getting a, a supply of electricity that was more certain, was less unreliable than the sometimes uncertain energy supply that they would get. So here, some of the value comes not just in the benefit of, of what you're buying over five, five years, but also in the ability to provide an additional benefit for the same cost as they were currently playing out today. So that's another way to reframe this question. Another example here, thinking maybe a bit more about the B2B space, in this case in agriculture, is from a company we've worked with called AgSpace. AgSpace uses a very impressive technology using satellite imagery and digital tools to help farmers optimize yield and reduce the risk of avoidable losses. It's really compelling technology. Um, but how do you connect a technology like this with farmers across Africa? And how would those farmers afford it? Well, AgSpace made a partnership with Standard Bank. Standard Bank is one of the biggest providers of finance for farming in Africa. The bank uses this product to evaluate the risk of the loans that it gives to farmers. And it helps to de-risk those loans, especially for remote properties where their own surveyors can't necessarily attend the farms. This in turn opens up finance to those farmers at a time when it might be risky for the bank to give them a loan, um, increasing their chances of getting a loan, but also making this technology available to those farmers where it might not otherwise be. So it provides the farmers with a discount through the scheme that allows the farmers to improve their use of the land. It reduces the risk for Standard Bank of their loans because they can keep a track on how the farm is progressing too. And it provides a really nice win-win from an affordability point of view for Ag Space, for Standard Bank and for the farmers. But it also, if you noticed, provides a win for awareness because it helps, and sorry, for accessibility because it helps to make this product accessible and, and I would say is aware as well to those farmers that would never have heard of the ag space technology elsewhere. So it's interesting to think how you can use partners who have complementary needs in the market to give you access and to make things affordable in different ways. There's more examples like that we can talk about for those that are interested later. So the last A is acceptability. This is understanding the customer requirements. It's identifying their specific wants and needs and ensuring that your products or services meet and where possible exceeds the desired requirements of your target market. An important point to note is in, emer in, em in emerging markets, wants and needs and requirements can be very different to the ones that you know in your current market sector. So make sure that you do your research into your customers. Where possible, walk a mile in their shoes, live their lives and do what they do. You'll discover so many things and they could really be important when you're coming up with a new product or system. Remember to fully understand their requirements. And if you want to guarantee making an impact when you and your next big thing arrive on the market, make sure you do this. So looking at acceptability in emerging markets, a really good example that I came across is the Wind Up Radio developed by Trevor Bayliss, CBE. Although success might have been more luck than judgment due to his kind of garden set shed inventor style, the Wind Up Radio actually became a firm favorite in less well-off African nations. This was due to the simplicity of the solution. It required no mains power or batteries, which are both hard to source in remote areas and very expensive too. It was sturdy and it could be thrown around without fear of breakage. 
and could be easily mended should it get broken uh, with it, due to its relatively simple internal construction. Most importantly, what the radio did was it reliably connected users to one of the widest forms of communication in rural Africa, that was the radio, in a simple and sustainable way. It was a natural choice and a natural winner. So on a personal note, and from my time as uh, Director of Industrial Design at Ninja, I've had, I'm going to give you an example that understanding con, uh, customer acceptability can actually result in reverse innovation. So a couple of years ago, we wanted to enter into the Chinese Asian market. And the first thoughts that we had was, hey, let's just translate the boxes and UIs and sell what's already been successful in America. It's going to work right. Now, if we hadn't have done our research and got the understanding of the market we were going into, we could have made some really big and costly mistakes. So what did we need to do? Firstly, we had to understand our customer demographic. If we look at the average Chinese consumer against the average American consumer, the Chinese consumer is a lot smaller in height and has smaller hands. Our products have been designed for larger hands of an American consumer. So we had large cups and pitchers. This, we had a, a very famous cup called the Big Gulp Cup that just wasn't acceptable to the Chinese consumer. So we had to revisit all of our products to change their ergonomics for the new market before we released. Secondly, is understanding cultural differences. Ninja sold itself on ice to snow. That was one of our major USPs in the USA. Chinese consumers actually wanted the opposite. They wanted a heating function to make soups and broths. So this led to the development of a blender that did both. What we found was this inadvertently reverse innovated a new market back in the US with the release last year of the Ninja Foodie Hot and Cold Blender. One interesting fact that popped up that we never foresaw was that there was actually regional differences in similar ingredients. Did you know that Chinese flour is actually more dense than that it found in the US? So by adding water to the flour, you create a dough. And this would be a lot more dense, which would add extra wear and tear on motors. By identifying this early, it meant that we could design around the problem and stopped it being a problem that would have to be a product recall in the end. So in conclusion, it's often the small things that can end up being the big things when it comes to breaking new and emerging markets. Don't forget to look for them and identify them. And always remember to do your research and know your end consumer. Great. So that was the four A's. And I hope, you know, these are, as, as experienced business people, as I'm sure the attendees are, you'll be aware of each of these aspects. But what we find is in it, when, when innovating in emerging and disrupted markets, we find that uh, you, you can't just assume these things are the same. And so as we as we work through these, what we're trying to do is not just to build on something we already have and add cost, um, but really build a system that serves all of the customer's needs and not just those of the product. So it's easy to talk about this, it's easy to say, but it's harder to do, right? Well, and I think the reason it's so much harder to do well is because of this, because of the assumptions that we make. So in some senses, there's a fifth A here, awareness, accessibility, affordability, acceptability, and assumptions. It's hard because we need to unlearn what we already know about our industry or about our category. And why is that so hard? Well, when you work in, in, in a siloed organization, it can be hard to think beyond the product in a really joined up way. The other pieces of the puzzle are, are someone else's job in the organization. And we all know how hard communication and alignment can be. And when your day job is to, deeply, to be deeply expert in a specific industry, it's hard to be aware of what's happening in other spaces. And while our organizations are built for being excellent, they might be being excellent at operations or product development or marketing, but they're often not excellent at challenging the status quo. In fact, challenging what made us successful in the first place. That's one of the paradoxes of innovation. And that's where Ignite comes in, the team Martin and I lead. By working together, we help companies identify those critical assumptions. We learn from other industries and we help them to challenge the limiting beliefs. By doing that, we can inspire new solutions to adapt and grow in disrupted markets. So that's what we want to share with you today. Thank you for making the time to join. We hope that you found it interesting and that the four A's tool or some of the examples that we've shared today might be interesting to you as well and help you as you grow your own businesses. We'd love to answer any questions you have if you have time and uh, very happy to, to connect and keep the conversation going if you'd like uh, to talk in more specifics. So thank you again, everyone, for the time to join together today. And if there are any questions, very happy to discuss those uh, with the time we have left.
Great. Uh, thank you, Alan and Martin, for that informative presentation. So right now, everyone, we're going to have our question and answer section. Uh, there's actually a Q&A tab at your upper left corner of the screen. If you have any question, please type in your, those questions in here, and we will try to answer them one by one. I'm sorry, Onyx, I wasn't able to hear that. Oh, uh, so once again, everyone, uh, we are now in the quest question and answer portion. So for all of the attendees that have any questions to the speakers, you can actually type in your questions at the Q&A tab. It's located at the upper left corner of your screen. There's a Q&A with a question mark uh, icon right there. You can type in your questions and we will read them and answer them one by one. Great, there's one question right here. It says, how about for medical devices, scope in emerging market scope? Uh, it's kind of very uh, large question. Uh, what do you mean? So uh, Roger, I can see your question. And I, I think your question is, you're asking whether there is scope for innovation in medical devices in, in emerging markets. And I guess you might be asking also, is this approach and methodology appropriate for medical devices and not just consumer products? So I'll, I'll try and answer that question. Um, so I think, yes, absolutely. The approach uh, is, is useful and is helpful. Uh, and I can see your clarification about uh, pandemics. So let me, let me touch on that. I, I think there's, um, you, I do some work in the consumer healthcare space and also uh, a little bit in medical devices, but I wouldn't call myself an expert in in healthcare. Some of my colleagues have particular expertise there and happy to introduce you if, if that's a space of interest to yourself. In terms of whether this sort of approach is useful for medical devices, I think absolutely. You know, a medical device is a tool, and yes, it's regulated for good reason, to help develop, to help solve a need that a, 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 either a healthcare practitioner or a consumer a patient has in that market. And there are many fascinating examples of of innovations actually the other way around that have been developed in emerging markets using the principles of reverse innovation and then pulled back into other markets. And it, it's partly, the success of that has partly been because the conditions in which those ideas have come from, typically one of scarcity, not having enough bed space, uh, shortening hospital stay times, uh, you know, patients just not having the money, have driven new invention and have driven new ideas that has allowed ultimately the cost of, um, the cost of delivery on those healthcare benefits to come down. You could you could look at the cost of healthcare provision in the US and, and that in, in major Indian cities, for instance. And the qual you can get great doctors in both and you can get great um, and you can get great uh, care in both. The cost comes at a very different level. And and partly that's the infrastructure of the US system um, and, and the insurance nature base of the US system. But partly it's also the conditions in which solutions have been found to some of those problems. There's a, there's a lovely approach that actually came out of Russia for eye treatment, where the eye treatment was based around um, building standard eye treatments into what essentially looks like a production line. You take people at the front end, you're able to use a junior nurse to triage them, then a, more, then a junior doctor, then a slightly more senior one, and then there's a specialization of, of individual roles, and the, the chairs or the doctors are literally moved past each other until you get out. It's a very high quality of care, but it allows them to provide a very high throughput of, um, of, of, of healthcare and, and healthcare treatment for uh, customers that are for, for patients that have a particular condition they're looking to serve. Now you, you know, it would be, that would be completely revolutionary in the US and it sits very much against the culture there. But yet because of the conditions and the high number of customers looking for service there, it's been a really interesting example of how you can drive much higher throughput, um, throughput procedures. And, and there are many others um, another example of that from a reverse point of innovation point of view is the development of much lower cost, um, I believe it was CT scanners, but, but it, I, I may be wrong, very low cost CT scanners, which were developed um, in, in China to a, a different specification. They may not be as good as the best, you know, million dollar plus CT scanners you can get in the US and multi-million dollars, but they are able to do a, a, a good job um, for the vast majority of cases 
and, and in many cases would completely remove waiting lists and dramatically reduce the cost. So GE has been able to take some of these scanners that they developed for their, their Chinese market and move them back. So I think the conditions of scarcity and innovating with the sort of approach that we've mentioned, considering how you get customers to you, how they afford the product, how they become aware of you, as well as the specification of the product, is as relevant and as applicable for, for medical devices. And if you're thinking about the pandemic and you know how do we get vaccines to uh, you know seven billion people, I think we absolutely need to use this sort of thinking because if we just adopt the Western mindset, which is let's put it on a drone and send it to someone. There just aren't enough drones and there aren't enough healthcare professionals to make this work. That's my point of view anyway. I'd love to know other thoughts if people have expertise in that area too. Uh, great. So is there any more questions coming from the other attendees? We still have time, so you can type in those questions at the Q&A portion. Are there any other questions, everyone? If there are no more questions, I guess that's it. Um, Alan and Martin, maybe you have some final words for our attendees before we close. Uh, just, just from myself, thank you for everyone for attending. I hope you found it of interest. Um, if you think the template is of interest, you can download that on our website. Um, at igniteexponential.com, um, and, and there's an article in the polls, or if you in, sorry, in the in the blogs, if you can't find that link, please let us know at the hello at Ignite Exponential or the address on the screen, and we can send that tool through to you. And if you try to use the forays tool and you have trouble, or you want to talk about how to use it best with your own colleagues in your own organisation, don't hesitate to send us send us a, an email or, or reach out to us. We'd love to support you to drive your own innovation and to to, to survive and thrive in these in these times. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today. Great. Thank you, guys. How about you, Alan? I, I was just going to I was going to re reiterate what Alan said there. It's Martin speaking now. Um, but yeah, it, any any questions that come up even after this webinar, just feel free to get in touch with us. We love helping people. We love answering questions. Let, let's connect. Let's start a conversation and see where it goes. You might not even know sort of what your question is, but feel free just to come and have a chat with us. We're always here. Okay, I thought that was Martin, that the first one. Um, so right now, thank you very much everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, rest assured, uh, within, 24 hour, within 48 hours, we're going to send everyone the recording of this webinar. And you can also always, you're always welcome to reach out to us. You have seen Alan and Martin's email address and the presentation just before, so you, you are, we are very much welcome in receiving your queries and we are very much interested in reaching out to you. So once again, thank you everyone for attending this webinar and hope you had a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.